Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's Espresso Break. Today, we'll be joined by Linda Kaufman, EVP of SmartStream RDU, and Jeroen Pilgrim, data analyst and regulatory expert, who will be discussing the complexities of sourcing and deriving reference data requirements for reporting. I'll now hand over to the team who will be able to share more insight. Thank you, Abby, for that warm welcome. And thanks all of, to all of you for joining us today for our espresso chat. For all of you that know me, I'm sure by now you've guessed that I am having a cup of tea this morning and not espresso. I am joined today by one of our in-house regulatory experts, Jeroen Pilgrim from our data research and development team. Jeroen, are you enjoying a cup of coffee or tea today for our chat? I'm enjoying a big cup of coffee, Linda. Wonderful, enjoy. So every time I think I can't possibly have anything more to say or hear about regulatory data, I realize that that's just not the case. Jeroen, you and I speak often about uh, the state of the current regulations and how important reference data has become. Right, RDU first ventured into the regulatory space uh, to support our customers for MIFID II. You were a big part of that adventure and still are. There were some real challenges uh, from a modeling and mapping perspective, weren't there? There were. So normally when we when we onboard a map of feed, there is a, a pretty straightforward relation of what comes in from the data source and what we distribute to our clients. But um, for our MIFID offering, this was slightly different. On the one hand, we knew what feeds ESMA were going to provide to the public like FIRTs and FITTERS, and with respect to FITTERS, we initially expected both the transparency values and the transparency reference data. So we could easily extend our data model with the FIRTs and FITTERS attributes. Mm, on the other hand, our clients required from SmartStream RDU that we could also provide them with data which could not be mapped directly from the FIRTs and FITTERS feed but was necessarily to facilitate them in complying to MIFID and uh, trading and reporting obligations. Um, let me give you some examples of that. So uh, ESMA may provide transparency threshold data and aggregated trading data and fitters, but for example, with reference to MIFR Article 7, clients need to have the cor correct deferral rules for a specific share. So uh, if deferral is allowed for a certain trade size, for example, shares above 10 million, you have 60 minutes reporting the rule. Uh, for non-equity the rule regime, uh, MIFR Article 11, there uh, was only a spreadsheet available with all kind of yes, no flags, which you certainly do not want to flatten out in your data model. So the challenge was to capture that in one unique attribute value. We have, we're talking about RTS 28 uh, clients who need the appropriate tick size regime for a specific share. Uh, RTS 27, best execution uh, size ranges need to be modeled and calculated. Um, providing transparency fallback values in case fitness records were or are still absent uh, and especially were in the beginning. Mapping a three-tier asset classification, uh, especially I think the asset surplus uh, construction is a story on its own. Uh, so, um, there are, of course, many more examples, but in general, I would like to say that the biggest challenge was creating MIFID data for our clients from non-feed sources like regulations or rule books. And often we had to extend our data model with some very specific tables to store these uh, calculated values. I think the challenge was even made bigger by ESMA when they decided that uh, the FITTERS reference data would not be made public and other data would only be available via alternative sources like um, TTC Excel sheets, for example. So those were the, the challenges that we faced. And I think besides that, um, we also had to deal, but of course the whole, the whole investment community had with the very poor uh, data quality that uh, ESMA offered in the first months after January, January 3, 2018 on which they, I must admit, have, of course, uh, very much improved. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Speaking of MIFID II, the craziness is not over <laughs> because now we have the SI regime for derivatives right around the corner. 
I know we've all been working really hard to uh, ensure we align with the regulation. On top of ensuring our MIFID product that you were just speaking about is working properly, we're also engaging with the APAs to ensure the SI registry continues to support the industry by communicating SI status accurately. But it's a it's a tricky space for sure. I know you've been busy sorting through the ESMA SI derivative templates that came out a few months ago. Uh, there's still so much for the SIs and really the whole industry to sort out. Yeah, like you said, it is a, a tricky space indeed. I think that the no MIFI 2 concept causes more nose wrinkling or brow furrowing <laughs> than systematic internalizer regime, which is a horrible name as is. But anyway, so as my aims with the, the, the systematic internalizer regime to move the dark of venue trading onto lit venues by creating a level playing field and greater price transparency between the uh, OTC and the, and the venues. And the key requirement of an SI compared to a non-SI is that it is subject to similar pre-trade transparency obligations as regulated markets, uh, multilateral trading facilities or uh, organized trading facilities. And ESMA expects that this will aid price formation uh, for investors. So ESMA requires of systematic internalizers to do a quantitative assessment comparing their OTC trading for own account with trading volumes provided by ESMA. And doing that assessment is not that hard for, for bonds and equities as the assessment needs to be done at an ISIN level. But for derivative, it is a slightly different game, which is uh, understandable, but also making the issue more complicated is that MIFID has introduced the concept of asset subclasses. And um, now the asset subclass is a collection of instruments with the same asset type or sub-asset type that share some predefined characteristics. Like for example, in OTC FX options, ESMA has established the subclass to be as a, the currency pair and a certain time to maturity bucket being, for example, zero to three months or four to five years. Um, ESMA has specified how they expect each sub subclass to be constructed, but ESMA also allows certain subclass criteria that are not part of any standardized ISO or, or ISDA domain. That's what they call the free text field from RTS2 uh, Annex 4 Table 2, which is their uh, uh, fitters reference data. And unfortunately, ESMA has also decided not to share this data with, with the market, which would make life for most systematic internalizers much more easier with respect to their SI determination. So as an example, take uh, forward freight ag agreements. ESMA requires surplus criterion, vessel size and freight routes, but they do not provide any set of standardized values to classify the criteria. And this makes it quite complicated for SIs to do the assessment in an automated way. So I think this is a challenge for the industry. And besides that, ESMA, after a radio silence of almost two years, have finally provided the format in which they will distribute these uh, six months EU trading volumes for derivatives. And well, I'm pretty sure also that this M% uh, separated criteria, key values, subclass construction is not directly received with a lot of applause by the uh, systematic internalizers community. Oh, no, I would think not. Uh, it's funny how every conversation always comes back in the data world to standards. The more standards we can all adopt, definitely the better uh, and more easily adaptable we can all be to these re regulations. Um, so jumping off of MIFID, I think the other hot topic in the regulatory world this year is, of course, SFTR. We all got a bit of a reprieve due to COVID, but time is flying by and already we're approaching the July 1st uh, phase one date. When we first glanced, I know that when, when we were first digesting the SFTR regulation and we first glanced at the reporting requirements, we didn't think there was much of a reference data need. Uh, however, we quickly realized that although the number of fields was small, so the quantity was small, that the reference data fields were actually pretty um, uh, complicated. Uh, and so it really drove us to create that SFTR API product that we've, we've um, rolled out to the market because uh, there was that need to help firms get through that complication. Uh, are there any fields in particular that 
drove you crazy when we <laughs> did the mapping and derivation um, for SFTR? Investment firms will have a reporting obligations for their uh, security financing transactions as of uh, July 13, uh, as, well as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic provided uh, three months breathing space to, I would say, really uh, already stressed out security finance industry. And that was felt as a great relief to many because from an operational point of view, the introduction of SFTR is regarded as being the biggest nightmare since the introduction of uh, AMIR for OTC derivative reporting. But you can imagine that uh, the reporting of the security financing transaction contains four different tables with uh, about 153 reporting fields and especially mid-sized to smaller institutions indicated that they do not have the tools to find all the data for their reporting obligations. And this certainly also affects the reporting obligations for the six mandatory reference data fields. And if you ask me uh, which one was the most hard one to map, then um, I would definitely say uh, the security or the collateral type because ESMA for some reasons that are still unclear uh, took the, the, the four character domain values that had already been proposed by the Financial Stability Board back in 2013 for, uh, for AMIR. And well, without hardly any definition or further description from ESMA, uh, SFT uh, reporting entities need to determine for equities and convertible bonds, for example, if they are constituents of 45 to 50 indices, indices that have been defined by, by ESMA. So you can imagine there's already a lot of overlap between these indices, but you can also imagine that, for example, one of the indices is the FTSE World, uh, World Index, which contains, I think, 85 to 90% of all shares that are also part of the other indices. Uh, there is a, a maintenance issue, for example, a share can be part of of an, uh, an index on one day and on the next day, it can be dropped out of that, uh, that index. And that would uh, force the security type to change from uh, main equity to other equity. And besides that, there's the cost aspect that most uh, indices require a license fee. Then with respect to um, uh, fixed income securities, uh, reporting parties need to inform ESMA if the security is either uh, a government security issued by supranational or agencies issued by either uh, financial institutions or uh, non-financial institutions. And well, I think that, that, that most reporting entities just like, like us do not have more tooling than a CFI code. And even that CFI code may be insufficient as uh, the code cannot distinguish, for example, between a financial and a non-financial issuer. So, um, after doing the mapping with, with the help of the CFI code, we discovered that there were over 25,000 unique uh, fixed income issuers that, uh, for which it was not clear if they were either, uh, in most cases, financial or non-financial issuers. So that meant that we had to do a lot of uh, uh, yeah, manual verification, also using uh, secondary open source for and but even that was sometimes not sufficient. So we really had to, to look on the, the World Wide Web to find out what this company actually was doing to uh, derive the correct security type. So yeah, that was quite a cumbersome challenge and I'm, I'm proud that we finished it. And um, well, currently we have a dedicated, dedicated operations team that monitors uh, something close to 24 seven, all new data and uh, enriches the data if needed. So it's a crazy space for both maintenance and original derivation. Absolutely. I think when, we're, when we are um, heading into 2020, uh, second half of 2020, uh, there's still a lot to do in the regulatory space. We have the uh, additional phases of SFTR coming up. We have, we spoke about earlier, the SI uh, derivatives regime. And right around the corner, heading into 2021, we'll all be uh, talking about Brexit once again. I know last year, trying to stay flexible through the whole fluid Brexit situation was interesting to say the least. Um, and uh, the hope is there. I think that the FCA keeps a lot of the uh, same formats and, and um, 
templates that ESMA has right now in the MIFID space and, and so that we can all manage the Brexit transition uh, successfully. So we'll all be watching that very closely in the, in the months to come. Absolutely. So thank you, Yaron, for joining me and for sharing a tea and coffee. Um, we, uh, again, can never talk enough about regulations and, and the impact on reference data. Uh, thanks all of you for joining us today. And uh, I hope you enjoyed our discussion and I look forward to um, more to come. Thanks. Thank you, bye-bye.